So what? Sue me. Well, don't. Michael Scott, George Klyovka. This is Locked On Big 12. You are Locked On Big 12, your daily podcast on the Big 12 Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Welcome into Locked On Big 12. I'm Drake Toll from ESPN Central Texas. Thank you for making Locked On Big 12 your first listen every single day. Do the subscribe thing, I guess. You know, kind of a wild thing when somebody gets sued. I've never been sued personally. I've never sued anybody else, and I hope that stays the, the exact same way that it is. It's not the case for the Pac-12, though. They are being sued by the only two member institutions left, Oregon State and Washington State. Now, what does this mean for the Big 12? Because I know you're thinking, oh, Drake, that's the Pac-12. This is a locked-on Big 12. Well, there are some implications that come when you consider the fact that Oregon State and Washington State want to go to a power conference. And that a coach from the Oregon State staff said, if tomorrow the Oregon State Beavers are in the Mountain West Conference, 25 players, 25 staff, everyone's going to leave. There will be a mass exodus. And that's no shock. If you told Texas Tech tomorrow, like, hey, Texas Tech, we've got to, we've got to relegate you to the AAC. Everyone's leaving. No one's got, The fans are going to leave. No one wants to stick around for that. Oregon State and Washington State are the exact same boat here. So what do they do? They pony up and they say, hey, look, we're the only two people who stayed in the Pac-12. And if you need, if you need context, here you go. That one crazy guy at the water cooler is like, oh, they're suing them. So everybody's going to have to go to the Pac-12. Everybody's going to go back. Not how this works. They're suing them so that they have voting power over the entire conference. They're trying to take back the conference that they're the only members of because the other 10 schools that are leaving, 12 schools that are leaving, whatever it is, have all still gotten into the ring together. Like, yeah, 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 we are leaving. We're still kind of here. They broke this, the, the grant of rights that said, hey, we will not, if we leave the conference, We will not vocalize this until August 1st of 2024. So the fact that these teams broke that thing that they signed on to, they have to do, makes Oregon State and Washington State feel as though they have a case to sue the league to make sure they are the only two with voting power. First things first here, it makes total sense. Everybody said, hey, we're leaving the school board. Hey, we're leaving the Board of Regents. We still want to vote about the future of this thing the next year, even though we're not going to be a part of it. That's stupid. I get why Oregon State and Washington State have a legitimate case, and it's it's obvious that they should be the two with the voting power. If, if Texas and Oklahoma were still the swing votes in the Big 12, you wouldn't like that. If the teams that were leaving were still the ones who were getting to call the shots, you wouldn't like that. The least you can do for these two teams that are left out to dry is give them complete voting power in the Pac-12. Now, if you're the Big 12, is this where you cast out the lifeline? Is this where you say, hey, look, we understand that Washington State and Oregon State are actually good football programs, have actually done something for me lately. I mean, I I was looking down on these two schools a month ago because of how perennially bad they've been in the sport of football for the last long time, my lifetime at least. And now here they are making waves in college athletics. Oregon State is ranked, squarely ranked. They had a great year last year. They had that magical basketball run, I guess, a couple years ago now. Washington State just beat Wisconsin. Luke Fickle led Wisconsin. Bet Cincinnati fans like that one. And here we are in this conversation of, is there an opportunity for the Big 12 to reach out to the Pac-12 teams that remain and give them a lifeline? And if you're a Washington State fan, Oregon State fan, Know that I have changed my perspective and my view the more I've gotten to know these programs, the more I've gotten to know these fans. Everybody from, from Arizona State, the leadership that didn't want to be in the, Pac, in the Big 12, they didn't want to leave the Pac-12, those people have just continually crapped on the league that's giving them a lifeline. No respect for that. That little 10% of Utah fans have been so vocal against the Big 12. So many Utah fans that are retweeting that the Pac-12's got so many ranked teams Utah fans are eating it up. Brother, you aren't in that conference anymore. You're in the Big 12. Why are you trying to make enemies? Not all Utah fans, but that weird 10% that stinks. Oregon State and Washington State fans, administration, players, have been nothing but nice, cordial, kind. They understand their place in college athletics. 
as a power five program, but not somebody who's flaunting it. Not somebody who's demanding they go to the SEC or the Big Ten and saying, hey, look, we just want to stay power five because that's who we are. That's their message. They're trying to save themselves. Where Washington State is excited about the idea of being welcomed into a Big 12 league, Arizona State wanted to stay. I mean, the way this should have gone, the way this should have gone for the amount of Utah fans, for the amount of Utah people who said they didn't want to leave the Pac-12, they could have stayed. Arizona State certainly could have stayed. And Washington State and Oregon State, albeit nowhere close to the same brands, albeit nowhere close to the same competitive aspect in athletics. Those are the teams, the fan bases, the administrations who would work, who would who would put a, a, a positive light around coming to the Big 12. They would work in the league because of the blue-collar attitude, because the attitude of respect, the attitude of reverence for what the Big 12 is, that so many Arizona State administrators and fans have gotten wrong. That that 10% of Utah fans, that the, the, the school leadership at Utah that was saying, we don't want to leave the Pac-12, we don't want to leave the Pac-12, when they knew the ship was sinking. Now, I'm, I'm so happy to have Utah. And I'm, ha- I'm happy to have Arizona State. I think that, that both fan bases, the majority, are great people. I got to interact with a lot of Utah fans this weekend, and they were spectacular. But I know... Oregon State and Washington State would bring value to the Big 12 because of how excited, similar to BYU, how excited they would be to be in this league. Here's the problem. Excitement doesn't push the needle. Money pushes the needle. Brand pushes the needle. There are already so many mouths to feed in the Big 12. There is not room for two more. And I don't think this would happen. I don't think that that Oregon State and Washington State would get here and try to overtake voting powers. But if the Big 12 expanded to an 18-team league, if the Big 12 went to 18 teams, and 10 of those teams were brand new members, you have now taken the voting power out of the hands of the IRA eight. Taking the voting power out of the hands of the original eight teams that stayed together. The original eight teams that worked together to create what the Big 12 is now. If it's 10 to 8, you've taken the voting power out of those who need to vote, who deserve the vote more than anybody else. And that's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it for SMU. It's not worth it to bring in Memphis. It's not worth it to bring in North Texas or Washington State or Oregon State or Boise State or Fresno State. The Big 12's in a spot right now where you have to stop. You have to stop. If it's my decision, if I could, there's some teams I might swap out. A brand standpoint, Washington State and Oregon State are teetering on the on the brink. They're, they're teetering on the brink of being group of five. Obviously, nobody's picking them up. That's not me saying something poppy or shocky. It's the way that it is. Same thing goes for Rutgers. Same thing goes athletically for Northwestern. There are teams for Boston College. There are teams that have been so piss poor for a duration of time, even worse than Washington State and Oregon State, whose brands aren't great, whose academics carry them, that are effectively group of five teams, lucky enough to wait around and lose in the power five. I think Oregon State and Washington State deserve a shot. However, it's not worth the risk. It's not worth sticking your neck out if you're the Big 12 to take these two teams right now. I'd love to have them. I would. I've changed my mind on that even. That is is something different than what I communicated three weeks ago. I would like to have them. But we can't. You can't. If you're the Big 12, you just can't take Washington State and Oregon State. It's a money. It's a votes deal. It's a power to the teams that stayed. It's loyalty to the teams that stayed. More so than your loyalty to Oregon State and Washington State. Sorry. The Big 12 picked up the four biggest brands they could, the four biggest brands from the Pac-12 they could when they could. And now it stops. But this doesn't. And this is Locked On Big 12, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. Do you ever feel like you have the wrong parts? That your parts aren't working correctly? And you need better parts? eBay Motors is here. I had a flat tire the other day. And instead of going and airing it up, you know what I did? I saw it at 26 PSI, and 25, and 23, and 22. I neglected that flat tire. Because I thought, I sat there and I thought, I don't know, when I drive faster and get on the interstate, the PSI goes up. 
goes from 23 to 26 on a hot day, especially. This is great. I don't need to air it up. All I got to do is just drive fast. And I was wrong. So I had to go to eBay Motors, where I am no stranger to finding the right parts. The right parts that fit. The right parts that fit me. This episode is brought to you by, Wake, by eBay Motors. With over 122 million parts, it's your number one ride or die. You will always find exactly what you need with a guaranteed fit. A guaranteed fit. You will fit this part to your ride perfectly every time or money back. With eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need, the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car to the MVP and bring that win home. Keep your ride or die alive at ebay.com slash motors. eBay. Guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBayMotors.com. Go check them out. All right. So all I'm hearing this week is, oh, the Pac-12 so good at football. Oh, the Pac-12 is better than the Big 12. The Big 12 is, 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 is withering away because the Pac-12 so good. I want to read something off to you that the the Pac-12 conference posted this week. It was on their Twitter page, and they say, eight teams ranked for the first time in conference history. That is a few more than any other conference in college football. Eight of 25 teams is roughly 33%. 30% of the teams in the top 25 come from the Pac-12. So here's the bad news, by the way. Here's the bad news. Two Pac-12 teams are ranked. Number five, USC. Proud member of the Big Ten. Number eight, Washington. Proud member of the Big Ten. Utah, number 12. That's the Big 12. Oregon at 13. Big Ten. Oregon State at 16. I'll give you. Colorado at 18. That's the Big 12. Washington State at 23. Again, I'm going to give this one to you. And UCLA at 24, the Big Ten. I love the fact that the two teams that are left suing the Pac-12 are both good at football this year. That is something that I can celebrate. And I also want to, because somebody right now is screaming at their screaming at their phone or their car dash or whatever they're watching this on. Don't throw anything. I get it. We I stake claim to Texas all week this week, right? Texas is it, they're in the Big Twelve until they're not anymore. Yeah, I know. It's, this is kind of a a a, 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 a misnomer is what I'll call it, where I say these Pac twelve teams aren't really in the Pac twelve, but I say Texas is really in the Big Twelve. I get that. I understand where you're coming from here. But what I what I what I want to put on display is that really honestly the Big Twelve didn't flaunt the whole Texas thing too much. We're kind of over that. This whole Pac twelve thing, which the graphics terrible by the way, graphic design is my passion. It's just like a just just words on a page here. The Pac twelve posts this out there as if it still exists. This isn't me talking about me, the host of Locked On Big Twelve, talking about one team that I'm like, all right, sweet, this team who's been so bad in the Big 12 for so long beat Alabama. We can celebrate the fact that one of our middle of the pack teams just beat Alabama. That's a fact, by the way. This isn't me doing that. This is the Pac-12, the conference that was so poorly run that everybody left, that the two teams remaining are suing the league, hoping for a lifeline, posting a graphic, saying, for the first time in conference history, eight of our teams are ranked. This is, it's like you've been shot six times in the battlefield. You're laying there dead. You're like, ah, moral victory. Like, uh, like at least I, at least in death, I killed the man that killed me. So, all right, sweet. Uh, I guess that, so, all right. You, you died with valor. We'll give you that. You're, you still died. I mean, it was kind of heroic. But also, it's the fact that, like, you put yourself in that situation. Nobody told you to charge. You're the one that charged across the battlefield. Of course, you got shot. You did this to yourself. So, yeah, you're all excited that you killed the guy who killed you. But, by the way, you A, you're, you're still dead. B, you, you did this to yourself. You disobeyed orders. You know, it's a weird analogy, but it's kind of what we're looking at right here. Right here is the conference that just shot itself in the foot. That ended its own its own league. It's like, hey, look at us. Yeah, well, we were so poorly, so poorly managed. We were so mismanaged, but at least our teams are still good. If you're the Big Twelve, you're looking right now, going, okay, Utah at twelve, who just beat a Big Twelve team. That's awesome. Colorado at eighteen. Arizona at least giving Mississippi State fits. Arizona State at least giving Oklahoma State fits. All right, 
play ball. This, to me, bodes really well for the Big Ten, obviously, because the Oregon and Washington, USC and UCLA, they are all ranked. And the Big Ten, hell, the Big Ten should put up a, a, a graphic this week. The Big 12, instead of saying three teams are ranked, should say five teams are ranked this week. I wouldn't care. I don't think anybody would scream at the Big 12. These are teams, these are member institutions next year. Teams that, if they're good this year and they're good next year, that's good for the Big 12. Sweet. You know what it's not good for? The Pac-12. You know what it's not bad for? The Pac-12. It just is. It just exists. It's just completely neutral. It's, It's a name. It's a name only. It doesn't exist anymore. It's not a real thing. These patches on this team's jerseys, the logos on the field, they're not real. They don't exist. This is of an entity, that word Pac-12, but of an entity that's not a thing anymore. You're playing, you pledge your allegiance. What you're doing right now is participating in something that is only an idea in our heads at this point. The Pac-12 is done. It's gone. So I'm a Big 12 fan. I'm like, heck yeah. We have five Big 12 teams ranked this week. Thank you, Oklahoma and Texas and Kansas State, Utah for being in there. That's awesome. And glad to have you, Colorado and Deion Sanders. So the Big 12 has five teams ranked. And if you're the Pac-12 and you want to scream, you got eight teams ranked. That's the most. Like the, the, you're just you're looking at yourself in the mirror, you know, crying, thinking, what a beautiful thing I've messed up. What a beautiful, beautiful thing that I have destroyed. And I hope the Pac-12 teams are good. I don't dislike the Pac-12 teams. Especially not individually. I just like the fact that the the leadership of this conference was so poor that it killed something that looks so promising. One of my favorite comments on the graphic was, this bodes well for the future of the (sighs) Pac-12. Oh, it's so good. It's a laughing stock. It continues to be. Similar to the Baylor football program right now. Here on Locked On Big 12, part of the Locked On Podcast Network is your team. It's every day. Baylor Bears, what are we doing here? Oh, is it time, you think, to open up the conversation about Dave Aranda? We have, I've broken down a lot of the teams that are in the, in the Big 12 this week and talked about where they stand. And, and for Baylor, you've now lost two straight games, one to Texas, one to Texas State, one to Utah. And I want to say this first about Baylor. The effort against Utah was great. The effort was great. The way you lost the game was not. You put it on cruise control. You tried to, tried to play conservatively, tried to play not to lose. And in the end, you lost to Utah in a game that you probably should have won down the stretch. Somebody said you were Utah. I think Dave Aranda said at his press conference, almost, uh, you know, Utah escaped with one. They did. If you watch the game, you saw Baylor outplayed Utah, albeit very slim, for three quarters. And they got dominated in the fourth quarter. This is, this is a, a program that won a Sugar Bowl and a Big 12 championship a couple of years ago, and now has fallen from grace to the point you lost to Texas State. You gave away a win to Utah late in the game. And now you're talking about firing a coach who has the most wins of any coach and program since the 90s, in the program since the 90s, in his first 38 games. 20 and 18. That's how bad Baylor's been historically, by the way. You are... Also have a head coach who, in the post game, you know, I like Dave Aranda. I'm going to play some clips here in a second of, of questions that I asked him in his press conference on Monday. But a coach in the post-game press conference on Saturday, who when somebody was like, hey, Dave, what do you think about the last second of that game? Let's ask about the last second. The pass interference, no call. He was like, oh, I could see it. When the refs told me there was one second, there was a gleam in their eye. And it's like Dave's demeanor changed. And he said, effectively, like those are the moments you live for. Those are the moments. There's such big moments in college football. It was so awesome to be part of that moment. What are we talking about moments to be a part of? You got one second left on the clock in a game you're down by seven that you were up by double double digits a second ago. You're up by two scores a second ago. And then, and now there's a gleam in your eye with a second to go. You shouldn't be in a situation where there's a gleam in your eye with a second to go. You should be in a situation where you've won the football game handedly, where, where, where you've taken care of business. But Baylor football and the whole taking care of business thing has not really worked out. The team is 0-6 in its last six games with losses to Texas State and Air Force. Good for their respective you know, divisions, conferences, wherever they are, bad compared to the Big 12. Not good. Not good. I asked Dave, you know, six straight losses. Do you feel like this is spiraling? How do you keep morale up? And I asked him about the false starts. The offensive line has false started 10 times in two games. What is your offensive line coach doing? Here's what Dave had to say. 
Dave, you talked about the Air Force game and some recruiting losses about how to keep this from spiraling. Mm -hmm. Now it's six consecutive losses. Mm -hmm. How do you keep tangibly the, the morale mm -hmm. with the team where it needs to be? Appreciate that. Yeah, I think from the inside in talking to the team, it's they can feel the um, the improvement. You know, I think going into the first game with Texas State, I mean, there wasn't very few people, I think, that saw that coming. And so I think the, the, the inexperience and just the uh, nervousness and the anxiousness uh, got a hold of us and we couldn't get it shook for a half and it was too, too much and defensively could never really recover. And then you look at this last game, just to, to attack it the way we did is what I, w I would have wanted to expect in the first game. And so to be able to kind of to um, narrow the focus and to continue to up the quality of the work that we do, to have the energy and the edge, but the execution to be upped, and then to increase the speed and to play faster and to play more confident. I think those are things that they feel and they, they can sense that. And so it's a matter of trying to Again, eliminate the distractions and stay right, stay focused on what's right ahead of us. Because I think they they feel some momentum, um, however slight. And I understand from the outside, I can I totally see it. But I think they they can see the improvement. Hey, you mentioned the, the false starts. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's on the staff, on the players? Are there repercussions in the midweek for that? Uh, where, where do you sit? Appreciate that. Yeah, I think it's everybody. I think, you know, we have a cadence at home. We have a cadence on the road. Um, you know, the, the, um, it's, it's been a big off-season project because we struggled to really have any variation with the cadence last year. And um, I, I think people jumped the cadence and took advantage of the fact that there was little variation in the cadence. And so now to have it and to be struggling with it to this degree at this point in the season is disappointing and so um, I think they're talking about that right now as we speak offensively on do we go to a road cadence you know when you're at home and ways to simplify it and um, and all of it and so I think it's a big factor I think the other part too is you know you got a new quarterback you got a new and a center that's for the first time really kind of being a center and I think you know I look at um, Clark and in, I mean he's one of the leaders for the offense he makes all the calls um, he's kind of the grown-up in the room with the offensive line. I think about everything that's on his sh uh, shoulders. And then on top of the cadence, um, um, there's a lot for him. So are we putting too much on him? Those are things that we're working through. That was Dave Aranda in the Monday press conference. Um, I'm not going to attack his, his personality, as so many people have done. They've been like, oh, he's so boring. Oh, I can't listen to him. Oh, it's terrible. I'm not going to do that because I, nobody was saying that in the Sugar Bowl. Nobody's saying any of that. The only comment that I can give on that is that I will give on that because everybody's got a different personality. You know, Tom Landry wasn't screaming in your face. The only thing that I can give you with that is I, I, I bet it's tougher for him to fire his team up. I bet it's tougher for him to keep morale up because so many times his players are wondering how to decipher what their head coach is telling them. Because a lot of times the stuff he says goes over my head. So if you're an 18 year old kid in that football program, I'd like to see how that interaction goes. That's, that's the, the thought that I'll pose there. I don't, it's tough for me the time I've spent around him to say Dave Aranda is going to get fired this season. I don't want to see him get fired. That's not my goal here. But the con, again, the conversation is open about the future of the Baylor football program and about whether or not Dave Aranda spearheads the future of the Baylor football program. Because right now, it doesn't look good. The trajectory is bad. The recruiting has been bad. The NIL stuff has been confusing. We don't know if it's good or bad. Nobody will really tell us. Most people are saying it's bad, but then Baylor is saying it's good. I just, I think Baylor fans are running out of patience. Ten years ago, they learned how to win. Baylor fans learned what it feels like when you win games. They learned what it feels like when you don't settle. And now Baylor fans are having to settle again in year four for losses to Texas State and a game where you're up by double digits on a really, really good Utah team and you let it fall to your fingertips. U Utah won that game in the fourth quarter, but the first three quarters were certainly Baylor's. Mm. And in the end, it didn't matter. You're 0-2. If Baylor, loses, if Baylor beats Texas State and loses to Utah, the same way they did, you think, hmm, all right, Utah's really good. This is still an eight-win team. You lost to Texas State. What's the, what's the ceiling for Baylor now? Oh, six and six would be crazy. 
that'd be a, a heck of a way to salvage the season. A six and four finish in the last 10 games after you've gone zero and six in your last six. I think Baylor fans are getting a little fed up here. Can't really blame them. What are you going to do, Dave? Ball's in your court. Ball's in your court. Not mine. This has been It Always Will Be. Thanks for making it your first lesson every single day. I love you guys. 10,000 subscribers. Did they come crazy? Am I crazy for saying that? For saying we can actually do that by the end of this year? I don't know. I'd like to try. This has been It Always Will Be. Locked on. Thanks again for making it your first lesson every single day. Dose Grande. <laughs>